Welcome back to the Foxhole. I'm your host, James Rosen, coming to you from the Washington Bureau of Fox News. You can follow me on Twitter, at James Rosen, FNC. Up to now, about the sharpest elbow thrown in the 2016 presidential process has been Senator Marco Rubio's characterization of Hillary Clinton as yesterday. But with the first of the televised candidate debates less than 90 days away, we are likely soon to enter a new and decidedly less gentlemanly phase of the campaign cycle. How bad will it get? Who better to ask, or whom better to ask, than today's visitor to the Foxhole, Diana Mutz, professor of political science and communication at the University of Pennsylvania, and the author most recently of In Your Face Politics, The Consequences of Uncivil Media, published in March by Princeton University Press. Professor Mutz, welcome to the Foxhole. Thank you. All right, so where I, I, you know, as a good, loyal corporate soldier, I am obligated to begin with, even though we're supposed to never judge a book by its cover, <laughs> Uh, with the cover of In Your Face Politics, which uh, shows as the very emblem of uncivil media, one Bill O'Reilly. Do you regard Bill as uncivil? Yes, the show contains a lot of what we'd call uncivil political discourse, meaning that it's far more heated than what we usually experience in our day-to-day -day lives. Listen, you know, arguments with one's spouse are, can be fairly heated affairs. I'm not sure that Bill ever goes that far. Is he the very <laughs> he face of can. incivility to well, you? Well, he is associated with high levels of incivility. And certainly, he, it's one of the shows that people think of when they think about uh, shout shows and people raising their voices and that kind of thing. And what's interesting to me about this as a political psychologist is that people actually do process it uh, the way they would a uh, face-to-face conversation that they were witnessing. And, you know, just as you might be uncomfortable if you're at a dinner party and there is a couple across the table arguing with one another, uh, people can have that same kind of physiological reaction when they watch television that, where there's heated debate. I've had that reaction as a guest on O'Reilly's show once a week for three years. Um, <laughs> but uh, one, before we depart from the cover of the book here, um, you know, the, your subject is in-your-face politics, by which I would assume you to mean the business of campaigns and elections. Bill O'Reilly is not a politician, uh, but your subtitle talks about the consequences of uncivil media. So are we saying that, that the Bill O'Reilly's of the world, the media figures, determine our politics? No, we're not saying they determine politics, but there's no doubt about it. The way the American public learns about politics is through the media. And whether it's during a campaign or in between election years, this is where public discourse on matters of political importance happen. What would you say by way of characterizing the status of uh, incivility in American politics right now? Well, I think what's happened is that uh, television politics has faced a huge amount of competition uh, with the explosion of cable and so forth. And as a result, they're no longer guaranteed an audience at 6 p.m. for the you know, regular evening news and so forth. Any time of day, you can find something else to watch on another channel. We all know there's just a constant flow of things to watch. And what we see happening is that people who are only tangentially interested in politics, those people are going to tune out altogether unless we make political television more lively, more interesting to watch. And I think that's really uh, a major contributor to more incivility in the kind of political discourse that we see on TV. But to the extent that your diagnosis is that political television today has come to encompass a kind of gladiatorial nature to it, uh, wasn't that the whole point was to make it livelier? And, and isn't that what you're prescribing then? Absolutely. In fact, um, what we see in the studies that we do is that people remember the content far better when it's in that kind of format, when it's uncivil, when people are raising their voices, they remember who stands where. Uh, they also are more likely to send it to their friends via email, clips of the show, so or to ask them. So that's a good thing, no? It's a good thing in that people are more likely to watch it than they would be if it were some calm, civil PBS And, and more debate. likely to remember it, as you just told exactly. us. And more likely to share it. Right. And, and enlighten their fellow citizens, right? That's right. And many things so about it are good. So you're pro-Bill O'Reilly. <laughs> well, there are some negative externalities that flow from it, unfortunately. Like what? What we find is that uh, particularly when 
people view politicians from an up-close perspective while they're being uncivil, it really intensifies their negative feelings toward the people they don't like. So it's not that people are going to change who they vote for or anything along those lines, but if you already don't like George Bush and then you're exposed to George Bush from a very close-up camera perspective, uh, being uncivil, you come away truly hating him. And that happens on both the liberal and conservative side when we have in your face incivility. So I think the negative side is that when it comes to governing, you know, we don't get our way all the time. About half the time our candidate loses and we have to be governed by the candidate that we didn't choose. And rather than seeing that candidate as yeah, disagreeable, but you know, we can live with him or her. Instead, um, we feel like they're just totally evil and you know, can't be tolerated. And I think that makes the process of governing particularly difficult. When was the United States and its civics uh, most recently not marked by in-your-face politics? I don't think politicians have ever been particularly civil. I, I think what's different is the way we experience that incivility these days. That is, we see it on television and we see it as if we were really up close next to the person who's shouting and yelling. Um, politicians have always said nasty things about one another. They've always had uh, acrimonious debate. They have even had duels and things like that in the past. So I would not argue that uh, politicians are acting any differently than they ever have. But I think the way we as a public experience that disagreement is very different now. But we've had television in our living rooms uh, since at least the 50s. Um, and I think by the time of the Wat Senate Watergate hearings in 1973, 90% of American homes had two televisions or more. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, when, in your view of things, it really marks the dawn of in-your-face politics? Well, based on my studies, uh, really it was the late 80s um, when shows made active efforts to really liven things up using incivility. Now, you know, there could be other ways of drawing viewer attention and so forth other than incivility that might do, not do the same what, kind What of shows damage. do you have in mind? So there are all kinds of shows. Um, there's Meet the Press that had a certain degree of incivility. Um, there were all kinds of programs that around the time that competition really exploded um, with the cable networks and so forth, that shows really had to work to get audiences. They didn't have to work to get an audience for the 6 o'clock news when I was growing up because there wasn't anything else on. Uh, so that was basically, you watch that or you didn't watch anything at all. What's different now is that our, uh, basically what we view is much more a function of what we choose. So people who aren't interested in politics, people who are only, you know, kind of moderately even aware of what's going on politically, they're not going to be exposed to these programs unless there's something exciting about them to watch. A real knockdown, drag out, you know, World Wrestling <laughs> Federation type of fight. And our TVs are also very different. It's not only high definition, they're huge now compared to what they used to be. Uh, so we have the impression of being far closer to the people in our television sets than we used to. Uh, is incivility, is there an economic dimension to this in the sense that incivility is the cheapest of the means to uh, stirring interest? I don't know if it's the cheapest. I don't think we've tried a lot of other approaches uh, to, you know, attracting attention. Certainly, you know, it's not particularly expensive to encourage guests to, you know, liven things up and go at it. Um, there may be other alternatives, and, you know, that remains to be seen. But I, you know, we've seen some. We've seen humor used as a way to draw in viewers who wouldn't normally be into politics. Uh, but I do think that it's, uh, it's a natural thing that people turn to um, when they see an accident by the side of the road. They rubberneck. They can't help but look. And that's because we're kind of hardwired in our brains to pay attention to conflict. And I think the same thing is true of television. When there is conflict and we're aware of conflict, it's hard not to watch. Even though if you ask people, they all say, oh, I hate that kind of thing. Incivility is just terrible. But the truth is we pay attention. Are there, as you look back on the history of this, um, certain hallmarks or certain signal moments in the rise of incivility or in-your-face politics that, uh, that you would identify? 
Yeah, I see it as more of a continuous process. It's also something that results from um, improvements in technology. For example, if we look at the news uh, back in the early days, look at it in the 60s and 70s, you'll notice that it's far more static. The, the anchor looks to be further away from us than the anchors do now, so there really is an in-your-faceness about today's political television. They're farther away. Um, because of technology, the camera pretty much just sat there. We didn't have the out-of-studio footage that's so common now, and that can be far more emotionally evocative. Our visitor to the foxhole today is Diana Mutz, professor of political science and communication at the University of Pennsylvania, director of the Annenberg Public Policy Center's Institute for the Study of Citizens and Politics, and author most recently of In Your Face Politics, The Consequences of Uncivil Media, published in March by Princeton University Press. I think most people would look back over the past 50 or 60 years and say that there has been a kind of creeping coarseness to American society and all sectors of it um, since, say, the mid-60s to the point where snack pack is now spelled S-N-A-K-P-A-K. <laughs> English language is, is dispensed with. Um, there's greater nudity, there's greater profanity, and so forth, right? So the question I have for you is, uh, in your view, is politics among the first or among the last of these sectors of American society to succumb to this coarseness? See, I would take issue with the premise of the question. I'm not certain that's really true, that, you know, if snack pack is our biggest problem, we're in pretty good shape. I would say it was our <laughs> biggest problem. But um, <laughs> what I see is that far less of this is private, far less of this is behind closed doors than used to be. And so if someone has an outburst, you can bet it's caught on somebody's cell phone camera or, you know, on another camera and it's posted on the web, and it's circulated around on Twitter, and so on and so forth. So I think that we're aware of all of the outbursts that happen in a way that we didn't uh, used to be, because they happened, but nobody was there to film it and, and pass it around. Uh, the last visitor to the foxhole preceding your visit here today was the um, journalist and author Matt Bai who has recently published uh, a book called All the Truth is Out, The Week Politics Went Tabloid, and it looks back at the Gary Hart sex scandal of mm -hmm. 1987. And his basic argument is that that marked a kind of a turning point in the way politics is covered. Uh, one could argue that the greater incivility was shown by Gary Hart to his wife or by the media that were uh, aggressively probing a candidate's sex life for news mm -hmm. material, right? Um, do you happen to see the Gary Hart scandal as a kind of a pivotal turning point in in in-your-face politics? No, not necessarily. And I say that because, you know, if you look back historically, Jefferson was publicly accused of being an adulterer. This is not exactly a new claim. Yeah, yeah, there are just lots and lots of them. So I see this as being a very um, consistent part of American politics, that it is coarse, that people do accuse one another of things and so forth, and I don't know that there is one pivotal point, but certainly uh, there's so much competition for our attention these days that these kinds of things draw attention. I mean, there's no doubt about it. We are hardwired to pay attention to those kinds of uh, exposés and so forth. It's interesting. Is this simply a, f a, a, a function of the free market? That is to say, people love conflict, they love spats, they love uh, in-your-faceness, and therefore the, 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 te the world of television and politics and media is simply responding to a market pressure and, and supplying more of it? Or are these institutions, in fact, tastemakers who, if they were a little more higher-minded of purpose, could encourage a less in-your-face civics on the part of the citizenry? I see this as something that is fairly hardwired in human beings. That is, uh, people will always pay attention to conflict, and evolutionarily that made a lot of sense, um, that our brains are wired that way. We still, when we go to the movies and we see a train come toward us, we pull back. Now, we all know that train isn't going to hit us on the TV screen or the movie screen. We react in ways that suggest that we're not really accustomed to representational media that we have, especially such high-quality, instantaneous kinds of things. So I think that there is not a lot you can do about this basic human tendency 
competition is going to mean that people resort to other means of attracting attention, and I think that's appropriate. I am not in favor of having uh, all political debate look like PBS because, quite frankly, no one would watch it, and then it wouldn't do any good when it comes to educating the public. On the other hand, I think there are possible ways to get public attention that aren't necessarily detrimental in the way that incivility can be. Um, I think we take our politics far too seriously these days. Uh, that is, you know, the, the idea that if we have a political program that is even uh, remotely lighthearted or that has an element of tension and competition in it, um, we think it's not good journalism. And I think good journalism needs big audiences. So the way we define it should be in part by the audience. Our guest inside the foxhole today is Diana Mutz, professor of political science and communication at the University of Pennsylvania and author most recently of In Your Face Politics, The Consequences of Uncivil Media, published in March by Princeton University Press. You write in this book, and I quote, so what might be used in place of incivility to create arousal and encourage viewers to pay attention to political events? In order to consider alternatives, an important first step is to disabuse ourselves of the notion that good political television must be a solemn affair. There is a tendency to equate the style of political presentation with its quality. Serious, staid programming that appears self-consciously educational and dull is generally given higher marks than something entertaining and frivolous. And yet the most valuable contribution that political television could probably make in the contemporary political environment is to bring the political middle back. Television, much more than any print medium, is still the most widely accessible political medium. Virtually all American households have one or more televisions, and this low-effort medium has the kind of populist potential that is essential to bringing the public back in. One po possibility, you continue, already being pursued is the use of humor. When a program is amusing, it gives people alternative motivations for watching it other than educating themselves. Thus, shows like The Daily Show and The Colbert Report can attract young audiences who seldom watch standard political fare. Interestingly, when coders evaluated these two political comedy programs in the list of most watched programs, they judged them only slightly to the uncivil side of the mean. By mean, you mean more or less average and not yes, mean-spirited. Yes. Instead, they scored high on a totally separate dimension, which was sarcasm, unquote. Now, of course, uh, myself as a longtime practitioner and victim of sarcasm, um, <laughs> I think I can say with some certainty that sarcasm itself can be uncivil. Absolutely. Uh, I'm not sure of the distinction being made there, but uh, what's your larger point with that passage? So we have satirical programs. We did in the 60s, like the, that was the week that was, and so mm -hmm. forth, Saturday Night Live in mm -hmm. the 70s and beyond. Um, and yet we've seen this rise all this time in, in, in uncivil media and in-your-face politics. So what good are those programs going to do? Well, it's not those particular kinds of programs that I have in mind. What I think we need is more innovation in the types of political programming that we put on, both during election years and in between. Uh, there are ways of attracting viewers that don't necessarily create negative consequences. And the analogy that I like to make is when uh, researchers discovered that boy, little kids really like violent television. <laughs> and that was something that drew them in like nothing else. But there were some unfortunate consequences for some kids to watching violent TV. Sesame Workshop came in, brought their researchers in, and found out that, hey, you know what? There are other things that also draw them in. So we don't necessarily have to use violence in order to draw in viewers. And I think the same is true of politics. For example, take a show like American Idol. Now, American Idol is something that was you know, a huge success, not only in the US, but in many uh, foreign countries as well. They had their own versions, in part because people uh, felt like they could call in and influence what was transpiring from week to week and so forth. Uh, I often think to myself, well, why don't they do something like that during the presidential primaries? You know, have a program where they give them the airtime, you know, 10 minutes each or however many candidates you have, to talk to the American public, do whatever they want, and let the American public decide who gets more free airtime the following week. Now, that kind of thing I think the public would think was great fun. They would feel empowered being able to call in. Individual states and their primaries and so forth, they would never go along with it. Obviously, they all have their own rules. 
Nonetheless, I think it would, a process like this would end up influencing the real world process of selecting candidates because it would be an opportunity for the American public, not just in Iowa and New Hampshire, but everywhere. And we're not to imagine that the various candidates would seek to influence that outcome by of course they having would. tens of thousands of followers dial in at the requisite time? Or? Yes, they would, but that happens on American Idol as well. And obviously, we're not going to have a binding process. All this does is determine who gets more time. I think that the, uh, that the appeal of American Idol is that you're seeing real people do real things, right, that are not easy to do, which is hit the high notes and mm -hmm. dance and so forth. Whereas in politics, you know, we kind of, we kind of intuitively understand that somebody else wrote the speech for them. Um, if and you think that's what they would do with it. I mean, that's part of what would be interesting about it. You get your 10 minutes. What you decide to do with that, if you want to give a boring stayed political stump speech, you go right ahead. But I have a feeling that won't be what grabs the American public most because they've seen that 10,000 times. Uh, so, you know, one of the things that's interesting, Canada, for example, already has a show called The Next Great Prime Minister. And the judges on that show are not, you know, Randy and so forth from our American Idol. They're all former prime ministers. Mm. And the candidates are not the actual candidates. They are usually um, people in their 20s, 30s, young people who have political aspirations. And they come on the show, people vote off one person a week and so on and so forth. But uh, you know, to have the actual former prime ministers as your judges, that suggests you're taking it seriously in a way. Uh, that draws in viewers, the public likes it and so forth. So, I think things like this are possible because people love a good competition. I mean, look at our fanaticism for sports in the sure. United States. And this is a competition. Uh, that's what makes it fun for people. The difference, again, being that you know your aide cannot step up and hit the home run for you. That's right. That's the great difference mm -hmm. between sports and politics. Mm -hmm. um, we were talking before the, the taping began about some of the signal moments across uh, the history of television and politics over the last several decades. Uh, about certain moments where uh, incivility or in-your-face politics has risen really to the fore. What are two or three of those moments that you would identify that people can go up and look up on YouTube, say? Uh, well, there are many of them these days. Um, one of my favorites is the Chris Matthews Zell Miller Exchange uh, at the Republican National Convention, and I think it was 2004, um, where you know, basically things get so heated that Miller says he wants to challenge him to a duel. Um, another favorite of mine is uh, the You Lie, uh, Joe Wilson yelling during the um, State of the Union taping uh, President, for President Obama. Obama. Um, another one that was not loud, but an actually uh, uh, stunning silence was the uh, event when James Carville and Bob Novak were on the show and Novak walks off the set um, in anger. You know, we all know what that means. We know that tension of the silence when someone walks out of the room and slams the door. So I think that um, as inherently human drama, those kinds of events are fascinating for people to watch because you, to some extent, yes, people know that this is theater, political theater. But on the other hand, when things go that far, they know that these are real people who are having strong emotional reactions to what's taking place. Another famous one was when then Vice President George H.W. Bush uh, was doing a live interview with CBS Evening News anchor Dan Rather in February of 1988 during the primary season that year and uh, was asked, being asked some fairly tough questions by Mr. Rather about the Iran-Contra scandal and responded famously uh, with a quip about how would you like it if I s judge your whole career by those seven minutes where you walked off the air in Miami, referencing mm -hmm. an earlier incident when rather piqued by the extended length of a tennis match, walked off the set, the match ended early, and CBS was left blank for seven and a half minutes or so. Uh, that seemed to me to be, um, was that a moment of in-your-face politics, or was it just gladiatorial? You know, I haven't seen that particular one, uh, so it's hard for me to comment on it. But I think any time we violate the norm, for face-to-face -face discourse that we're kind of accustomed to from our day-to-day -day lives, it draws attention because it is a norm violation. And one of the most fascinating things that we found in this research is that the format that's very popular these days, which is the boxed people, the yes, heads, yes. Uh, often many of them on the screen at once. We're probably going to do it right here, Are so we? just okay, we're well, not immune. Boxed heads, 
um, tend to be among the most uncivil. And it makes some sense because you're not actually talking to each other when you have nine little boxes. There are people in different locations. Um, it's the reason that people like Ted Koppel don't want their guests to appear in the studio with them because it's really difficult to be mean and nasty to somebody to their face. But when they're not in the room and they're in a studio down the hall, it's actually pretty easy. Um, but we, are, we have a strong set of social norms for our behavior. And most of the time, we back off when we start to have a conflict. But on television, that's not what happens. Uh, Last question. Sure. Um, since you define in-your-face politics as the conduct of politics when it uh, goes beyond the kind of courtesies we would display to each other in our regular civil discourse. Do you regard that our regular civil discourse itself is nastier and more in your face than it used to be outside of the political media context? The, the interaction between uh, customer and cashier or, or, or husband and wife or any of the other sort of interactions that occur multiple billions of times a day in our discourse is that more in your face than it used to be? Uh, not based on any research I've seen. In fact, social norms are pretty much as they always were, and certainly they change in various ways, but uh, people still obey the same norms. They differ from culture to culture, but no, people are actually pretty polite to one another in face-to-face -face scenarios most of the time. Behind the wheel of a car does not count as face-to-face, -face, correct? <laughs> well, as I say, that even those incidents we know about now in a way they didn't before, you know, national media were around. So if somebody's horse and buggy <laughs> drove another one off the road, you and I wouldn't know about it unless it happened to be in our town. Right. Our visitor to the foxhole today has been Diana Mutz, professor of political science and communication at the University of Pennsylvania, director of the Annenberg Public Policy Center's Institute for the Study of Citizens and Politics, and the author most recently of In Your Face Politics, The Consequences of Uncivil Media, published in March by Princeton University Press. That's going to wrap it up for this episode of The Foxhole. I'm your host, James Rosen, signing off from the Washington Bureau of Fox News. You can follow me on Twitter at James Rosen FNC, and we will FNC you next time.